according to your preferred criteria, Ryan Murphy's true crime film Dahmer Monster. The Jeffrey Dahmer story, which debuted on September 21, has subsequently become either the biggest success or the opportunistic nadir of his Netflix career. Just over three weeks later, he is back with a brand new true crime thriller, as the uproar over that show continues to simmer. The Watcher will likely be popular with subscribers, but only time will tell, although I'm assuming it will be. But after viewing all seven episodes, I can say with certainty that this is Murphy's first truly excellent drama series since leaving Fox for Netflix in 2018. And that's thanks in large part to a serpentine plot that lays the groundwork for an exhilaratingly inconclusive finale. A family purchases a dream home in the affluent suburb of Westfield, New Jersey, only to discover that someone else has already, in a sense, laid claim to it. This is the story of The Watcher, an adaptation of Reeves Weedman's unsettling 2018 New York Magazine article. The Watcher, who claimed to have been watching their property for the greater part of two decades as their father and grandpa had done before them, began sending them typed messages in the real-life story. The letters included vague threats directed towards the family's children, or, as the watcher refers to them, young blood, as well as spooky inquiries like, do you know what is inside the walls of 657 Boulevard? There were plenty of suspicious neighbors, but the local police seemed pretty apathetic, even as weird things kept happening. Eventually, scared out of their wits and facing ever-worsening financial straits, they put the house up for sale. Unsolved when the original article ran, the case remains a mystery in 2022. An endless list of suspects, these details serve as the framework for Murphy and co-creator Ian Brennan's television series, but unlike many other docudramas, The Watcher departs frequently and abruptly from the truth. They change the family's names as well as the number and ages of the children, after subjecting them to an illegal lifetime movie called The Watcher. To better serve an all-star ensemble and a plot that analyses each suspect in turn, characters are added, removed, composited, and embellished. There is no doubt that such artistic license was required, the real family never even moved into the house. And Murphy is careful not to abuse it with the same type of flamboyant inanity that makes so many of his recent performances so tiresome. The Watcher does what good psychological thrillers do. It takes everyday fears to nightmarish extremes. One disconcerting aspect of the article is that, rather than uncovering too few suspects in a town that prides itself on safety, it finds too many. The show magnifies that sense of community dysfunction. Protagonists Nora, Naomi Watts, and Dean Brannock, Bobby Cannavale, and their kids, 16-year-old Ellie, Isabel Gravitt, and her little brother Carter, Luke David Blum, are surrounded by weirdos. The prickly couple next door, Mitch and Mo, Richard Kind and Margot Martindale, a match made in TV heaven, wear absurd matching outfits, orient their lawn chairs so that they're staring directly at the Brannock's house, and brazenly harvest arugula on the family's property. Elsewhere in the neighborhood, historical preservation control freak Pearl, Mia Farrow, takes the Brannock's interior design choices personally, while her emotionally disturbed brother Jasper, Terry Kinney, hides in their disused dumbwitter. Then there's real estate agent Karen, Jennifer Coolidge, maintaining her post-White Lotus Genesis momentum, an old classmate of Nora's who espouses a sort of demented girlbiz wealth gospel and seems overly eager to earn a second commission by reselling the house. A private investigator, Theodora Birch, Noma Dumaswini, whom the Brannocks hire on the advice of a dismissive police department, digs up even more suspects. The cast swells. Former 657 owner Andrew, Seth Gabble, spews a current adrenochrome conspiracy theories. A 19-year-old home security entrepreneur, Dakota, Henry Hunter Hall, allows himself to be seduced by Ellie. A local teacher, Roger, Michael Nowry, is known for having his students write anonymous letters to Westfield homes they love. Theodora brings news of a patriarch who slaughtered his wife and kids in the house, then disappeared, in the 90s. The possibility arises that Dean invented the Watcher because he doesn't want to admit to Nora that they really can't afford the $3 million mansion. And so on and so forth into buyer's remorse oblivion. Every character is a little bit guilty, it would seem like a disadvantage that the genuine watcher has never been found, yet it actually becomes a strength. Instead of coming up with a cliched ending, Murphy and Brennan make the most of everything's shaggy dog appeal. While the great mystery is never fully resolved, smaller ones are frequently an in ways that only lessen the significance of the letters. A few episodes after the Brannock family and I witnessed paramedics remove two bloodied bodies from Mitch and Moe's home, it was revealed that they had actually just left town and that their unhappy adult son had feigned their deaths. Dean acknowledges sending one note but denies sending the others.
then his supervisor gives him a video of a strange woman getting into bed with Dean, leading to his termination. We know it was Dakota because he admits to it before realizing he has no idea how the woman in the footage got into the house. In other words, everyone is at least a little unhinged and most have done something awful including the Brannocks. Dean allows the stresses of his career and new home to gradually transform him into the prototypical rich white conservative suburban dad. Fixated on his daughter's nascent sexuality, he sicks the cops on Dakota, who is black, even though she's past the age of consent, and it's perfectly legal for the two of them to date. When Dean tries to confront Mo about Andrew's claim that his three-year-old son walked in on her, Mitch, and a cabal of the town's elders sacrificing a baby in the basement of 657, she rightly equates the accusation with the deranged conspiracy thinking of Canaan. What's the matter with Westfield? The Watcher isn't merely a critique of conspiracies, though. It addresses the more pervasive paranoia that permeates modern American life. The Brannocks spend a lot of money on security and monitoring, but it only serves to further erode their sense of security. Former jazz vocalist Theodora started a second profession as a PI after becoming so intrigued with true crime. To deter her from learning she had cancer. Even though there is rarely a relationship between the source of people's anxieties and what actually threatens them, the show frequently demonstrates that there are valid reasons for individuals to be worried. Joe Mantello's character, who may or may not be John Graff, gives Dean a sermon on the church. Female purity and an alarmist theory that predicts the country is due for a generational crisis. But Graff, if he exists at all, is a psychotic killer who murdered his entire family and thus obviously posed a far greater threat to them than atheists or teen sex. Regardless of his relationship to reality, Graff embodies something genuinely dark within Westfield. An aging community's simultaneous fetish for youth, aka young blood, and resistance to change, i.e. historical preservation. This is what makes the place such a culture shock to a family that has just relocated from New York City. Murphy and Brennan pay conspicuous homage to Rosemary's baby, from Pharaoh's presence on the other side of the young old binary, to the basement baby sacrifice, to the name Dakota shares, with the Upper West Side building, where Roman Polanski's horror classic takes place. The Watcher is in part a reversal of that movie, it's the suburbs that feel strange and sinister to people used to living in the city. There are political implications here, in an era of blue cities and red suburbs. But the show complicates that dynamic, too, when the Brannocks move back to Manhattan and find the subway messed up for hours one day because someone pushed two people onto the tracks. All of the aforementioned, even the topics that are immediately apparent, such as money, real estate, and women working for creative fulfillment as opposed to women working for pay, has greater thematic resonance where it comes from. This all-inclusive approach to meaning creation has frequently been Murphy's downfall. On his shows, the artifice is typically turned up to 11, liberal philosophies are then preached at the same volume, and everything gets too loud to enjoy.